Tonight, we're starting a new series called Follow. We're going to spend four weeks in it looking at uh, the journey of the disciples, that their journey is an interesting one. It's a weird one. Uh, They have some interesting moments, and all of them in relationship to Jesus. And so the disciples are the one, especially the original 12, that up close and personal get to see the miracles of Jesus that we just taught about in the previous series. They're the ones who get to experience all of these great things. They're, many of them are the ones who are writing a lot of the New Testament. And so we want to look at the journey of the disciples because their journey should and in some ways be very similar to ours if we profess to be Christians. And so we want to learn from them to go, okay, if I'm going to follow Jesus, what did it look like to originally follow Jesus? And so when I was a freshman in college, uh, I joined an organization at a and where, <laughs> guys, do you know how good it is to have just filled the room with adult leaders from a and And the Baylor people who thought that they had dominance are being overtaken. And it, it does Holy Spirit work in my soul. Anyway, that's nothing to do with where we're going. But when I was in college um, at a and I joined this organization. And um, during our time in that, you got assigned a partner. And you got assigned a partner where you were going to lead a small group of freshmen um, in kind of this little, like, Christian community and, and small group discussion and in Bible study and stuff like that. And um, it, it was the, really the only club that I was in at A&M. And as we go through, you, you have this, like, big reveal where the people who are kind of over your camp, they reveal to you, hey, here's who your partner is. And so we get to this moment, and uh, we write letters to, to our partner, and uh, we don't know who they are, so it's like, hey, random person. <laughs> and so I get my letter, and I read through it, and I find out that my partner is a girl named Haley Kane. What's up, girl? Um, no. <laughs> and we have this moment, and, and that letter, though not personal, was the beginning of something awesome. If you've ever been uh, in my office, there's a bag. It's actually tucked away in a drawer, so you can't see that. But there's bulletin boards around my office, and there are letters tacked to all of them. Some of them are from Haley, from our time in dating. Some of them are from uh, former students that have written things to me at different times of ministry of what it meant to be in our ministry and what that looked like. And, um, and my bag is actually n- every note I've ever gotten since I was like 12 years old, okay? And so like your generation doesn't necessarily uh, like appreciate the art of note passing, but I love it. Like, there's nothing better than getting a handwritten note that somebody kind of slaved over, and, and may, especially if a girl wrote it, because it's always pretty, right? You're like, oh my gosh, they just know cursive better than us. It's fantastic, right? There's nothing better than sitting in class, and, and a note comes down the row, and you're like, this is it. It's from her. And then they go, to the dude next to you. And you're like, I hope she hates you. You just still keep delivering it, right? So I get this first note from Haley. Well, Haley and I go on to be friends. I begin to kind of develop a crush on Haley um, because obviously she's a great person. And we actually, during the summer, we have two friends who are also in the same camp and they are also partners. And so we're in a group text of the four of us talking about our summers. Uh, Most of them are in the DFW. I'm down in Georgetown. And all the things that we're doing and things that we're seeing. and, And I find out that my friend, his partner, was sending him letters. And, and I went, where the crap is my letter? I want letters. So I start like demanding letters from Haley. I'm like, listen, I don't know if we're really friends. I don't know if we're really partners in this extravaganza, in this journey of life. I, I have no letters or notes to prove it. And she would be like, I-35 runs both ways. And I was like, oh, how dare you? You don't want a letter. I want a letter. I'm not writing someone. Someone's not going to appreciate such things, right? And so I'm, I'm like jealous, and those two actually, they went on to get married too. They're some of our best friends in the world. And one day in the mail, a letter came. I will read for you bits and pieces. <laughs> Haley and I are friends at the time. We're not dating. I have no clue um, whether or not she likes me or doesn't. I do know that I like her. I know that she's very pretty. I know that she loves Jesus. All of a sudden, she's checking boxes that no one in my life has ever checked, and I get this letter. You can see that it's real. There's little holes in it because it's freaking old. <laughs> Written in purple marker, name in all caps. Look, even the time to spell my name. Obviously, she was in love. 
It starts with this. <laughs> parts, exclamation point. Now I need to define real quick. Parts, parts is an abbreviation for partner um, because A&M really is a cult. It's just the best one you're ever going to be a part of. And so we use words that the rest of the world doesn't use. And so this is very normal for her to start a letter like this in this moment. And she goes, I'm finally writing you your letter. I hope you're happy. Remember our first letter when I said that I was super excited like 50 times? Well, I'm still super excited that you're my partner. If you were anyone else's, I'd be jealous, dot, 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 smiley face. For proof, there it is. <laughs> we move on. She goes, I know that you will be a great leader, which is where I had her fooled and trapped. Your heart for high school, ki for high school kids is inspiring. I love how friendly you are, because I used to be, and to her, I was. And how much you care about the relationships that you have with others, especially the friend you've been to me, I feel like it's exactly what I've been needing after a sucky freshman year, because salvation and sanctification is a process, so she still used language. <laughs> I can't wait to see where the Lord takes our friendship and all of the people will we impact. Little do you know, she thought she was friend zoning me. No, no, I never give up. But here's where it gets good. Love you, exclamation point, all caps, Haley E. Kane. And this is about as good as our marriage gets because she didn't know I was going to read that tonight from the stage. So we talk about that moment. My love for letter writing has always been with this desire that, that there was somebody on the other end of the letter that cared enough about me to write it. And that, that in, a, in a romantic moment, in this moment, this was the beginning for me, that I was like, she wants me. <laughs> for sure, like for sure. And, and you and I, we want, we want to be wanted, because to be wanted changes the relationship. When somebody else wants you in that relationship, whether friendly or romantic or whatever it may be, when somebody wants you there, it changes. You don't begin to do things out of obligation anymore. You do them out of love, because, because that person wants you there. You, you bring purpose to things. You're necessary. They appreciate that you're there. They have, they have dreams with you in mind. To be wanted in the relationship, to be desired. For you and I, we live in a time that we're so completely connected, yet so incredibly distant. And that, that our chief desire often is just to be wanted, to be desired, to know that somebody else just enjoys us being around. That's why in middle school, Right, like very early on at 12, we start like, some of us at 12 are like, we, let's start the dating game. It, it's not because at 12 you're like, you know what? One day I want the spouse that the Lord deems necessary for me and I need to start surveying the population now. Like no 12 year old is that. They just go, wait a minute. Well, my friend over here has a boyfriend or a girlfriend that their mommy and daddy takes them to the movie theaters. And, but somebody wants them. And I want to be wanted like that. And in the midst of that, that, to be one, it changes the game. And in my house, when Haley and I are clicking on all cylinders, like, like when we're in the mode where, where we're texting each other in the morning, we leave at different times and wake up at different times, and we're just, hey, praying for you, hope that you had a good day, hope everything's going good. When we're like in that mode, and we come home, and we're happy, and Emery's happy, and everything's great, like she can look at me and go, hey, oh man, the floor is a mess tonight. Do you mind, like, sweeping and mopping? And I will, like, two-hand mop the floor, right? Because we're, we're in the zone. And I know that she appreciates me. I know that she loves me. I know that she wants me in her life. And I'll begin to do anything that she asks. It changes the relationship. You and I, man, our, our chief desire comes down to just wanting to be wanted. 
Some of us more than others. Some of us, I mean, we have very healthy lives. We go back to a home with parents that just fawn over us. They're like, oh my gosh, remember that spelling bee that you crushed in third grade? We still love you for that. It's on the mantle in a glass case and a tiny little trophy, right? Like some of us go back to that home. Some of us go back to the home. We don't think our parents even know that we exist. And so some of us have, have a deep depth of wanting to be wanted. Some of us feel like we're competing maybe with our siblings all the time, that our sibling is just earning favor with mom and dad over and over and over again. And it's like we're failing over and over and over again. I remember as a kid, just in my personality, um, I enjoy succeeding and I enjoy pursuing um, success by however I define that. And so as a kid, I like doing good in school. I like doing good in sports. I like doing all those things. Neither of my siblings is that their personality. And so naturally growing up, it was easier for my parents to say kind words about me. And there was a moment at 16 where I was sitting in my mom's room and she goes, Lane, do you think I play favorites? I looked her dead in the eye and I said, absolutely. She goes, well, who do you think my favorite is? It's me. It's me, mom. And my mom starts crying and I was like, oh, I thought we were playing a game. Now we're in real life. I go, what's wrong? And she goes, well, your brother and sister said the same thing. I was like, oh my gosh, they know too. <laughs> and I, and I, I was like, but in, in this moment, understanding even now as an adult, that there was inadvertent competition in my household for my parents' favor. And that sometimes you feel like you live in that world, you just wanna be wanted by your parents. Or you feel like every single one of your friends is always in like this deep relationship and they're so in love because prom's down the road and not to be in love means to go to prom alone and so we choose love. And and so you're like, oh, and you begin to want a relationship. You you just wanna be wanted. And then when we take that into the church, we take that into our relationship with God, we begin to study scripture and we spend time in sermons and a lot of times it feels like, and so we need to go do this and we need to be like this and we should be doing these things and this is how we move and this is the action of of the people of God and, and if you feel far from God, then you just need to do this, 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 and this and then you will be closer to God. And somewhere along the way, God feels really, really, really high up and we begin to look at his word and we go, it feels like a lot of do's and don'ts from a guy that is really incredibly distant. And, and I want to be with him, but I'm not sure he wants to be with me. Even if, even if I stand up here and I go, man, God loves you, and he wants what's best for you, and you go, man, I just don't feel like, like God actually wants me. Like, given the lineup, I feel like I'm going to get picked last. Like, I feel like I'm in this playground moment with God, and I'm going to be the last one to be picked on his team. I bring nothing to the table feels like everyone else is walking close with him, but, but not me. And so I don't, I don't think that God wants me. And for you and I, man, when we talk about our relationship with God, when we talk about Jesus, we have to understand that the way that he interacts with the disciples, and the vast majority of things that he says to them, not all of them, but the vast majority, apply to us directly if we claim to be believers in Jesus. Now, I, I want to take a pause for a moment, because sometimes... In Christianity, we begin to create our our Christianity pyramid. Okay, and so what I mean by that is there are those of us that at seven years old or 10 years old or 14 years old or whatever, we walked down an aisle, we said a prayer, and we gave our lives to Jesus, hoping to go to heaven. And that's that's our version of Christianity. And that's good enough for us. And we'll go to church occasionally, and we'll sit there, and we'll sing some songs. And when asked, do you believe in God? We say, of course we believe in God. We were born in Texas. This is still the South. Amen. And we're we're like, "Of, of course. And then we go, oh, but are you a follower of Jesus? Well, no, that's next level Christianity. Those are people that are very serious about their faith. We know that because when we talk about our faith, if you were to come into my office and I was beginning to ask you about Christianity and things like that, you would maybe tell a story of, well, I gave my life to Jesus here. I accepted Christ here, but I, I really got serious about my faith here. And then you continue moving on, and then you're like, oh, and, but then I really had a grasp on Jesus here. And then one day, well, God, God called me to ministry, and that's the varsity Christians. And so we, we look at Christianity as our stair-stepping ladder and the pyramid of Christianity, and here's what I want you to know. When we spend four weeks and follow all of these things that Jesus interacts with the disciples, these are calls for everyone. Not specific for everyone, that the call to Christianity, there, there's not an upper step ladder, there is just, this is what believers do. And so if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, if you claim to have accepted Christ, to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man who has forgiven your sins and invites you into a relationship with God, this is true 
for you. And so that's where we're going to be at in these four weeks. And we walk into this moment in Matthew chapter 4, and we see Jesus' first interaction with a few of the disciples. Not all 12, just a few of them. Jesus has began his ministry a little bit. Um, he's walking around, and he's actually saying the words, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. So Jesus is already preaching. People are probably hearing because if somebody's walking around going, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, in that day and time, like, people are paying attention. But they're waiting for the kingdom. A, a man that's calling you to repentance, to turn from your sin, to live differently, okay, you've got my attention. So Jesus is preaching that, and then we move into verse 18. It's up on the screen if you need it. And it says this, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Now, this is weird for a million reasons. Sometimes we read the Bible, and the Bible will say a weird thing, and we go back and we go, ah, oh, but in the culture and time, it really makes sense. There is no culture and time that is a tradition of fishing for humans, okay? And so when Jesus walks up, and he goes, hey, come with me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. They're not like, we know what that is. We're going. Like that's for them to drop, they'll be like, that guy's a psycho. He can put like hooks in people's mouths. He can throw humans in nets. This is a weird statement, right? We live in church culture long enough, some of us, and we go, mm, yes, fishers of men. No, that's weird. We're allowed to say that Jesus says some weird things, and then that their response is, got it. And they just start going. And that's weird enough, but, th but then we continue on, and he says, going on from there, or some versions say a little further. I always want to know how far a little is, right? Like, did he move 10 steps, and there's another boat that just saw two of these dudes drop their nets to go follow the man fishing guy? And they're like, yeah, us too. Uh, but it says, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets. And he called them. It doesn't say what he said. Probably something similar to, come people fish with me. And immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him, which means there's got to be some sort of conversation. We don't see it in the text where these guys look at him and go, Dad, I know you were training us for the family business, but did you hear the invitation that that guy has made? It is a sweet deal of people fishing. We cannot turn that down. This is a weird beginning for the movement of the people of God. Like, feel that, know that it's not normal that Jesus is walking down a beach and he's looking at blue-collar work. He's not even hanging out in temples. There are religious people. Like, there are people equivalent to doctors and pastors, like people with educations. He could go in there and go, dude, you know a whole lot of the Old Testament. You know more than me, and I was there for all of it. Why don't you go ahead and come along for the ride? He could have done that. Instead, he goes to the small business owners the mom and pop shop people and says, listen, I know your dad has been grooming you your entire life to take over the family fishing business. I've heard great things about Zeb Zebedee Fishing Co. However, would you consider joining Jesus People Fishing Company? And they go, are you the one saying that you're gonna build a kingdom? Which by the way, also nuts. And he goes, yeah, it's near. Cool, I'm leaving the boat. And their dad has got to lose his mind, right? Like, this is the moment that you go to your parents and you go, listen, I know, I got a full ride to UT. I'm brilliant. But Howard Payne University is calling. And I think that they want to give me the best education. And your parents go, we're stealing the drugs, right? Like, that's, that's the moment. That's the moment with Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves a whole lot of questions. Primarily, we have to ask this. Why do they get out of the boat? 
Jesus has not been going around. He has not healed people. He has not mind read yet. He has not performed miracles. He hasn't fed the thousands. He hasn't done anything that we talked about. He has done no miracle working. He is preaching, repent, for the kingdom is near. They haven't seen any of that yet. They know less about Jesus than you do after sitting in here for 15 minutes. And Jesus says, get out of the boat. Why do they do that? One, we have to assume this. Jesus is a pretty compelling person. Two, I think when they hear about the guy that's saying, repent for the kingdom is near, they know enough about the kingdom that they're hoping for that they want to be on the same team as the guy who's bringing it. They have an idea of what that kingdom might be, and so they want to go and be around that guy. But they have, they have no clue that he's even God yet. Primarily, do you know why I think they went with Jesus? Because he wanted them. Because Jesus did the calling. Listen, if, if Jesus would have waited a little bit, performed some miracles, there would have been a line of people with disciple resumes, like ready to be one of the 12. As a matter of fact, we see that in scripture. Jesus performs miracles, heals people. They try to like jump in Jesus's boat and Jesus is like, uh-uh, not today, Skippy, and leaves them there. Like, we see that. These dudes from the very beginning, I think that they go with Jesus primarily on the stance that he wanted them. And so for you and I, we can, we can start here. Like we can follow Jesus because he wanted us first. We can be close with God because Jesus wanted us first. Because in every other area of life, we sing about knowing all other loves that are not real when we're trying to earn favor. Jesus wanted us first. And he calls us. And it's not just that he wanted them. I think it's this. What he called them to is compelling. They have no clue what it means. But they know this. Whatever they go to do with Jesus, they're going to have purpose. He has something for them. Some of us, we say, man, I just, uh, we signed on to a Jesus that just keeps us out of hell. Or we, we just signed on to a Jesus so we can be good Christian kids. But that's not Christianity. That's not salvation. That is not what it means to follow Jesus. I mean, he, he calls them first. And he wants us for a purpose. He's inviting them to take part in the kingdom that he's pronouncing as he goes. We're going to see exactly what it means to really be fishers of men in kind of the next three weeks and what that looks like. But he's calling them to something compelling. He's giving them a purpose that, that they, they didn't have before. Before, they're just catching fish. They're day job people. Jesus is inviting us to something else. Jesus is inviting us to something else. He's not just inviting us to sit in chairs and be good kids so our parents can pat us on the back and they can go, well, our kids are the Christian kids. They would never do anything like that, like cheat on tests, get drunk on the wheel. Like, they would never do that. Jesus calls us to something more than just not, follow, not doing certain things or just following a moral code. He calls us into the kingdom and to be part of making it. And the reason that we get bored in our faith is we didn't answer, come and follow me. We answered, come and sit and be good. And that's not the gospel. But Jesus calls them out of boats. He changes their life. It's worth leaving their family for. It's worth leaving their comfort for. It's worth leaving financial stability for, which is a message that I need to hear regularly. It's worth all those things. And they go. And they have no clue what's to come. Here's why that's important. We do mission trip interviews with our students who go on trips with us, getting ready for DC, and they have to share their testimony with me, which means they have to share their story of what God has done in their life, how he's brought them into his family, and what he's doing in their life now. And a lot of times, here's what we hear. Well, at seven, I went to VBS and I gave my life to Jesus, but I didn't really know what that meant. But then at 13, I went on a mission trip, and now I understand the entirety of the gospel, and I get it. I get Christianity, and now I have arrived. And I never do this, but I always want to, so here's the secret. It's out for those of you that sat in that room. That is a load of crap. Because at 27, with a couple degrees and a professional Christian, I have yet to wake up in the morning and understand the vastness of God and where he is taking me. 
There are deep mysteries still in the basics of the gospel. He is still changing me. Praise God. I know my wife and family is very thankful for that statement. Like, he is still doing a work in me because I'm following him, not because I've arrived. And so it's impossible that that you and I, at any point, we just go, we get it now. And you don't have to. You don't have to get it all at once. You don't have to understand it all at once. The only thing the disciples know is that Jesus said, get out of the boat, come and follow me. That's all. They have no clue that it's gonna mean that most of them die at the end of this journey because of this. They have no clue that it's gonna mean that Jesus is gonna die. You know more of the story than the disciples know because you've celebrated Easter. You don't have to know it all. You just have to know that Jesus is the one who asks you to come and follow him. And the question is, are you sitting or are you following? Is your life changing day by day, month by month, year by year because of your relationship with Jesus or do you look the same now in February of 2020 as you did in February 2019? That's how you know. If you're following Jesus, can your walk with Jesus amount to attending the loft, sitting in a chair and listening to me preach? Or does your relationship with Jesus affect what you do in chemistry class, what you do on the basketball court, what you watch on Netflix? That's how you know if you're sitting or following The call from Jesus is to leave your old life behind and walk into a new one where he wanted us first and it makes all the difference. One of my best friends, his name is Michael Sawyer. He's the youth pastor at First Baptist Georgetown. And I love him because he's brilliant, Um, like legitimately smart, not just kind of that like you've had one conversation with a person or you've read a blog from them smart, like he's legitimately smart. And when I was in high school, he was my associate student pastor. So he was my Tyler when I was at First Baptist Georgetown as a high school kid. And I remember we're at a retreat, and I'm talking with him about his education. He went to Howard Payne to get his undergrad. Um, And he was like top five in his class at a big high school. And I was like, yeah, that's like, I was like top 500 in my class. And uh, And I said, he begins to tell me the story, and he goes, well, so one day I'm I'm driving home from my part-time job in high school, and I found a check that I had lost underneath the seat of my car. And I pulled the check out, and I looked at it, and it just happened to be the amount of money um, that I was going to need to apply to Yale. And so I said, well, well, what the heck? I'll apply to Yale, which is never a thought that I've had. Like, that's how you know you're smart, when you're like, I'll apply to Yale. Why not? Cashes check, fills out his application, sends it to Yale, gets accepted to Yale. By the way, I've never actually met another human um, that's been accepted to Yale. I assume it's a fictional fairy tale land because I don't know anybody from there. Gets accepted to Yale, and his senior year goes, you know what? (laughs) I think God is calling me to minister to teenagers for the rest of my life. And Yale can't give me the best education for that. So I'm going to go to Howard Payne. What? Yale can give you an education. I assume they know something about teenagers. He goes, he goes to Howard Payne, gets his undergrad for free, knocks it out in three years because he's supposed to be at Yale, goes on, gets his master's degree. He's in his early 30s, has a doctorate, wants to start his second one. No one wants to do two doctorates that's just in youth ministry. Like, if you don't want to be a professor, why do you keep going back to the worst place on earth? School. One of the craziest things about Michael is his relationship with his parents. It's not great. You want to know why? And here's what shocks me. Like, like my dad, in the very least, he's, very, he's so proud that his kid is in ministry but his parents have a son that could have gone to Yale. But he committed his life to what God was calling him to. And I go, we just have to stop and think and go, why would you leave behind 
everything that the world told you to go do. Because Jesus called me out of the boat. He had no clue when he gave his life to Jesus as a little kid that it was going to mean not going Ivy League, but going Brownwood, Texas. Like, he had no clue. He had no clue that he was going to serve at churches of less than 100 people for the vast majority of his career, that he was going to be in multiple different places. He was going to be at his fifth church by the time he was 30. He had no clue. And he had no idea the vast depth of who Jesus was that he knows now after a whole ton of education. What he knew at six or seven was, follow me. What he knew at 18 was follow me. When he left every church, what he knew was follow me. He did it because Jesus wanted him first. And that made all the difference. Let's pray. If you're in the room tonight and you had a friend tell you about Jesus and Christianity,